We serve a God who's never lost a battle ever. He's an undisputed champion of all eternity. I don't think you believe that. I said our God is an undisputed champion of eternity. There is no battle. There's nothing that you're facing today. There's no challenge too big for our God not to conquer. The Bible says that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Amen. How many believe that today? I'm not so sure. When I was a little younger, I want to share this story with you. My son used to, he used to box at a professional gym. And it was really fun to go there and watch these people train because they train like, like machines, like animals. And they were pros and they were on TV and they're, they're famous people and they made a lot of money for doing what they, what they did, which is punch people in the face. That's what they did. But they would train so hard. I, I played football throughout my youth to see these men train in a boxing gym was completely amazing. They were the most conditioned people I've ever seen in my entire life. They trained night and day. They trained every single day. They didn't get any breaks. They would train and train and train and train. Never stop. And they did this for a reason. Because you have to train in order to be the champion. In order to overcome the battle that they were about to face, they would have to train. Without training, it was a sure loss. Sure to lose if, if there was no training involved. They were, they were sure to get knocked out. But when they train, they do this thing called sparring. Have you ever seen that? It's when they put on some headgear and they get in the ring and they start, they start, they start boxing a little bit. And there would always be a moment where someone would go too far and someone would get knocked out. And the whole gym would be around the ring and they would tell them, get up, get up. Everyone, get up. Don't quit, get up. And all the training that they did allowed them to get off the canvas and to keep going. And we as Christians also have to train. Because there'll be times in our life where we get knocked out. The enemy gets a good one in and you find yourself on the floor, on the canvas. And you have to develop a muscle, a condition within yourself that says, get up. That does not allow you to stay down. Because being a Christian is no easy fight. It's not for the faint at heart. Being, a, being born again is super hard. And I would be lying to you if I said it was easy. The truth is, you can be born again and lose your job. But you got to get up. You can be born again and get evicted from your house, but you have to get up. Are you breathing out there? You can be born again and your wife leave you. Your husband cheat on you, but, but you got to get up. You can be born again and get sick. But there has to be something inside of you that can only come from our God that tells you, get back up, son. Get back up, daughter. Don't quit. Don't quit. I've won every battle. I've conquered everything. Hell in the grave. Everything is under my submission. 
all your problems, every challenge that you're facing, God has already conquered. Give it up for the Lord, our conqueror, our champion, our savior. He's a good God. Tell your neighbor, get up. How many know what I'm talking about? How many been knocked out? I'm not talking about in the spirit. You get knocked out. You fall into something. You fall into a trap. The devil lands a good one. You find yourself on the floor, but you got to get up. Tell somebody, get up. If you don't get that within you, you ain't going to last very long. I can't recall how many times I've fallen in my walk with God. So many times. But every time the Holy Spirit just keeps compelling me. And it's almost like I hear the clock, the count one, two, three, and the Holy Spirit's get up. And the angels are cheering for me. Heaven is cheering for me. Get up. You can do it. Get up from there. Keep going forward. Keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep praying. Keep believing. Somebody shout, get up. If you're down tonight, you ain't gonna stay down. Not tonight, tell your neighbor, not tonight. We're getting up. We have to get that in us. If you don't got it, we're gonna get it, amen? Amen. We're gonna read tonight. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to John. We'll be reading from John chapter 5. We're going to look what this whole idea of getting up looks like. Why don't you give it up for our, all our online community watching tonight. Tell them to get up too. They're, they're probably sitting on their couch eating ice cream. Tell them to get up. We're about to go in. John chapter 5, beginning in verse number 2, it says, Now in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called Bethesda. And this pool has five porches. And in these porches lay piled up a great number, which means too many to count. A great number of sick people. The word sick means that they're helpless. They're powerless. They're weak. Along with the sick people, there were people that were blind. And the word is just not, they couldn't see. The word, the word means their eyes were gouged out. They had no eyes at all. They were sick. They were blind. The Bible says, and then there were lame people there at this pool. The word lame, it means that not only that they couldn't walk, they didn't have limbs. They didn't have arms. They didn't have legs. They were dismembered. Then the Bible says, at the same pool, there were people that were paralyzed. The word means that they were withered or they were wasting away. All these people in one location at one poolside were all together. And the Bible says they were waiting for the waters to be stirred. The Bible says that an angel of the Lord would come down at predetermined or appointed times. 
And the angel would come down to this pool where the sick, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed were at. And the angel would come down and stir the pool. And the first one to get in the pool, the Bible says that they were healed of any disease that they had. How many know our God can heal any disease, any problem, any situation, any challenge that you're facing? God can heal it. And verse 5 says that there was a certain man at the pool. Certain means he's particular. He stood out. There was something about this man. He was not just a man. He was a certain man. The Bible said that he had an infirmity. That word infirmity means that he was in a fixed position. He was not moving. He was in the same place for 38 years. Now I wonder at what point did he get there? Who brought him there? When did he decide that he wasn't leaving, that he was staying there for his entire life? At what point did he decide and tell his family, I'm not coming home. I'm going to live and stay in this place for the rest of my life. And I'm just going to hope that I can be healed. I'm going to hope that I can time everything right. I, I'm just, I'm going to be here. And the Bible says that Jesus walked in and he's seen this man. Jesus noticed him standing or lying there. And the Bible says that Jesus knew that he had been in that condition for a long time. How many know Jesus knows your condition? He knows about your situation. He knows how long you've been in it. He knows how long you've been travailing through it. He knows how long you've been standing in it. He knows how long you've been believing in it. Jesus knows everything about your condition. And so he walks up to this man. He didn't panic. He just walked up. Completely in control. And he says to the man, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water stirred. I try to get in, but someone else always gets in before me. Jesus said to him, Rise or get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Immediately, say immediately. The man was healed. And he picked up his mat and he walked for the first time in 38 years. I've been down for the count, but not that long. I've been backslid, but not that long. 38 years. If you've, been, if you've been down for 38 years, there's hope for you. There's still hope for you. Jesus is walking by he's walking through town after town village after village he's on his way up to jerusalem but he makes a detour and stops at this pool bethesda and down that pool he finds this this certain man and this certain man he catches jesus attention because the man has been there for a long time in the same position. And so Jesus notices him and he walks over to the man. I like the fact that Jesus came to him because the man can't get to Jesus. And so Jesus reaches out to him. How many know there are going to be times in your life where you can't reach Jesus, that Jesus is going to have to come to you? Have you ever been in a time like that? Well, you can't get up. You're so depressed, you can't move. You're so messed up, you can't move. You can't make a call, you can't make a text, but you better call on Jesus because he can show up right there at that spot where you're at. Sometimes Jesus comes to you. 
I love that. That makes it so much easier. Jesus walks up to him and he asks him these words. Do you want to be made well? Do you want it? The translation reads like this. Do you want your life back? Jesus walks up to him and asks him, do you want your life back? This question sounds absurd. It sounds so insensitive to the man's condition. The man is sick. The man is weak. The man is stuck. The man can't move. It sounds like Jesus is completely insensitive. What do you mean do, you, do I want to get up? What do you mean do I want my life back? But the question is very profound. Because getting your life back comes with a whole new set of problems. For instance, he's not going to be able to hang out at the pool no more. He can't, you can't hang out at the club no more. Are you sure you want your life back, sweetheart? You can't hang out at the bar no more with the homeboys no more. Are you sure you want your life back? Do you want to be made well? Because if I make you whole, if I make you well, you're going to have a whole new set of problems. You might have to leave your sick friends. Leave my friends? Yeah. You're going to have to leave your friends. If I make you well, you're going to have to leave your poolside friends. You might have to get a job. Uh, he hasn't worked in 38 years. Some of you have been in prison. You get out of prison, you say, what do I do? You got to get a job. What? He's going to have to get a job. He's going to have to pay taxes. Tax season's coming up, y'all. It's here, I think. He's going to have to, oh my gosh, take care of his family. He's going to have to play with the kids. He's going to have to do homework with the kids. He's going to have to take his wife shopping. Are you sure you want your life back? Sometimes people come to the altar, pray, pray for me, Pastor Joe. What do you want? I want my wife, I want my wife to come back. I want my marriage. Are you sure? Where are you staying at right now? I'm staying at my mom's. Well, if you go back, you know you got to pay rent. Are you sure you want your life back? Do you want to be made whole? Are you ready for the responsibility of getting your life back? Because you say it, you pray for it, you want it, but are you ready for it? Because getting your life back is not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of work that's involved. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to push. You're going to have to fall and get back up. You're going to have to keep on going. Because people will be depending on you. Your family will be depending on you. Your children will be depending on you. And when you fall, you have to learn to get up. Are you sure you want your life back? Can you handle getting your life back? I'll tell you what, things are real easy locked up in a cell. Things are real simple, running the streets, stealing and robbing and doing, and doing dope. That's easy. Try raising a family. Try being an honest citizen. Come on, somebody. I, I, I wish I had someone who knew what I was talking about here tonight at the Way Road Outreach. Is there anyone here who knows what I'm talking about, about getting your life back? Are you ready for that? Yeah. 
And the man, he begins what? To make excuses. Make excuses why his condition hasn't changed in the last 38 years. He's got 38 years of excuses. He's been thinking about his excuses for a long time. I'm sure at the pool, everyone's just bouncing back. What's your excuse? Oh, this hurts. I don't have no arm. Oh, this hurts. I don't have no legs. This, well, this, everyone's just sharing their problems. He tells Jesus, I have no one to put me in the pool. The water stirred up too quickly. There's too many people. The angel, he's, he, he, he's too fast for me. I, I'm too slow. Someone always beats me. I don't have good credit. I don't have a car. I don't have an education. I don't have support. My mama don't love me. My daddy don't hug me enough. All these excuses. And the Bible says that the man answered Jesus. And the word answered means that he kept on answering. He wouldn't shut up. He kept on making excuses, rambling on and on and on and on. 38 years of excuses. It, might, it would be fine if it was one year or two years, but 38 years, come on. You got a mustache and a beard by now. You got a full grown beard and you're still on your mama's couch smoking weed and playing video games. What's wrong with you? And he keeps jawing at Jesus, telling him one excuse without the other excuse of why he can't get up. And if Jesus didn't interrupt, he would have kept on talking for another 38 years, I bet. He would have talked himself into the grave. I know it. Because when you're sick, that's all you talk about is your sickness. Your owie, your hurt. Who hurt you? Who stole from you? I've been, I've been, you know, sometimes my back goes out and I just complain and complain and complain every day. I'm sure my wife gets sick of it. Every day talking about, how's your back today? Oh, it still hurts right here, and this is starting to hurt, and this is starting to Come home from work, how you doing? Oh, it still hurts, I've been hurting all day. I'm sure after the third week, she's like, come on, be a man. Where's my husband at? Straighten up, get up, fight, pray, move forward. Come on. Push. That's not my husband, I know. But when you're sick, that's all you talk about is your sickness. You wake up and it talks to you. And you dialogue with it throughout the whole day. Some of you have been dialoguing with what's wrong with you for, th for 38 years. There was a woman who came to the downtown campus and she sat right behind me. The whole time during service, she's complaining, 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 complaining about her back, complaining about her knee, complaining about her eyes, complaining she was broke, complaining she had no car, complaining she had no, she had no job, complaining, complaining, complaining. And finally, by the end of the service, I felt the anointing, the power of God. And I said, I turned to her and I said, listen, God can heal you right now. Whatever pain, disease that you're facing right now, I know that God will heal your knee I know that God will heal your back I know that God will give you strength I know God will will come through for you right now just let me lay my hands on you she said no no pastor Joe don't touch me she said I have an SSI court hearing coming up if you heal me right now Oh, 
Oh, my God. And I said, oh, my God. She said, wait till after the hearing. And then I'll come back. My goodness. And I told her, "How many, do you know that God's about to heal you and change your life? Do you know that when God, God touches you right now, that you're not going to need SSI? You're not going to need uh, all these things that you're struggling for? Did you know what God's about to do? He's about to bless you right now. You're going to make three times as much money as you ever would on SSI. Are you kidding me right now? What with all these excuses? Tell somebody, get up. Jesus has the power to eliminate all excuses. When you have Jesus, you're not allowed to have any more excuses. He wipes them all away. I like how the claps went down right there. He says I could, you could do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He's the God of the impossible, the unimaginable, the unobtainable. He's the eternal living God. He's unchallenged, unmatched, undefeated. The Bible says that Jesus walked around everywhere and anyone who came to him and touched him, he healed them all. Whatever disease that they were facing. There's no challenge that you're facing today. No struggle, no opposition, no devil in hell that Jesus cannot win. We're not allowed to have excuses. They go out the window. This pool is not like the pool at your apartment. It's not like the, the YMCA or Raging Waters. It's, it's not that kind of pool. The Bible says that people were laying there. The word laying means that they were piled on top of one another. People piled on top of one another. Too many to count. None of them are identified by their names or only identified by their sickness. Their sickness is their identity. Have you ever been known for your issues and not for your name? Nobody knows your name, but they know your issues. You're the family member who strung out on drugs. You know my brother, Alan? No, I don't know him. You know, come on, the hothead. Oh, yeah, Alan, I know him. You know the girl Wendy up the street? Who's that? The one who likes to get drunk and take her clothes off. Oh yeah, I know her. How about Rita and Jose? The ones that are up the street always fighting. Known for, for their issues. Have you ever been known for your issues? Nobody want to talk to me now. That's fine. I guess I'm the only one. There's pictures of my family and we go over during the holidays and they, you see all my brothers and sisters and they're all lined up, they're all smiling. And guess who's not there? Guess who's not there in the picture? The one with all the issues. Excluded. Unknown. Only by your condition. But not your name. The unnamed people of the world piled together, body over body, disease over disease, piled together. The pool has something in common. Their disease has bonded them together. The helpless with the helpless the gouged with the gouged, 
the dismembered with the dismembered, the wasting away with the people that are wasting away. They're all together in one place. Why is that, Pastor Joe? Because people who share the same disease often feel the need to stay together. They form alliances around their disease. They develop support groups, friendships, drunks with drunks, drug addicts with drug addicts, heroin users with heroin users, speed freaks with speed freaks, perverse with perverse. They're all hanging around, lumped together. Because when you're sick, when you have a disease or an addiction, it's easier to be around other sick people just like you. It's easier to be around people who have issues just like you. And so you disconnect from the ones you love. You disconnect from your children, from your family, your mother and your father, your brothers and sisters, the ones that love you so you can hang out with your crazy sick people on the street. Because hanging around with other sick people makes you feel normal. If I hang with sick people like me, maybe I'll forget the fact that I'm sick. I'm just going to hang out and shoot dope all day with my homeboys. Maybe I'll forget the fact that my marriage is messed up. Maybe I'll forget the fact that my children don't have a dad right now. And so we isolate with other sick people because we cannot socialize with healthy people when we're sick. That's why you don't go to the Christmas party at home because if you get around healthy people, they're going to remind you that you're sick. And so I don't want to hang around with healthy people when I'm sick. If I hang around sober people, they're going to remind me that I'm a drunk. If I hang around people with money, they're going to remind me that I'm broke. If I hang around people who are married, they're going to remind me that I'm, I'm an adultery affair. If I hang around church people, they're going to remind me that, that I'm a sinner. So I'd rather blend in with other sick people so I won't have to face my issues. These people are together. They're an association of the sick. Praise the Lord, somebody. Who are you hanging with? Tell your neighbor who are you hanging with. problem with this train of thought is that if you hang out long enough with people who are sick that you can stay stuck in the same place for a long time and if you stay stuck and refuse to change refuse to respond to God's calling, and you stay stuck, the devil will assign you a porch for the rest of your life. And you will die on that porch. And he will snatch you up into his eternal flame on that porch. If you don't get better, the devil has a porch waiting for you. There's five of them for every disease that you have. Your porch is the place of your disease. It's a thing that you're bound to. It's your stronghold. It's your lust. 
It's your relation. It could be a relationship. It could be an addiction. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. But you're stuck. As long as you're stuck on that porch, you cannot move. And you're dying right there on that porch with all the other people that can't get up. But I got good news because the Bible says that Jesus walked through the pool yard and Jesus walked through the porch and Jesus saw a man that was on the porch and he saw a woman that couldn't get off the porch and he saw a young lady who couldn't get off the porch and Jesus turned to them and said, get up. Jesus came to take me off the porch. He came to break me out of Bethsaida, away from the pool, out of my sick society, out of the hand of the devil. Oh, Jesus came to set me free. Oh, I'm so glad that he came. Is anyone glad that Jesus came to your porch? This man believes that his position is the problem. He believes that, this is what he believes for the last 38 years, this is what he believes. If I can get out of this position, if I can just get out of prison, If I could just get from this location, the porch, and if I could just get to the pool, my life would be better over here. He thinks that his position is the problem. He said, if I can get from here to there, my life would be better. If I can get the new job, my life will be better. People that will appreciate me, a company that I can grow in. If I could just get the new job, my life will be better. You know what? If I could just get a new wife, because the one I have right now is just, she's crazy. You don't understand, Pastor Joe. She's nuts. She doesn't clean the house. She doesn't comb her hair. She lays in sweatpants around all day. If I could just get a new wife, if I could just get from here to over there, if I can just get a car that runs, oh my gosh, where the tires are not all bald, where I know it's going to start in the morning, I know it's going to take me from point A to point B. If I could just get a new car, my life would be better. If I could just get off the streets and not be homeless, if I could just have a house, Oh my gosh, it would be so good if I can get a house. If I could, I heard people say, if I could just get out of San Bernardino. (laughs) I've had people come to to downtown and actually say that. What can I pray for you? I want to get out of San Bernardino. (laughs) But changing your position is not going to make you better. Because if you're messed up here, you'll be messed up over here with your messed up self. If I could just get married again over here. Oh, wait, I'm still messed up. And it doesn't matter what job, what wife, what car, what house you have. Because you can't escape you. And it really don't matter where you move. You can put your mat over here or over there but you're still in the same position. You're lying down and you can't get up. 
The man needs a revelation. The revelation is this, is that Jesus doesn't need to change your position in order to change your condition. That Jesus will heal you right where you're at, right in your stench, right in your dismemberment, right in your messed up life, right in your paralyzed, blind state, in your lame state. Jesus can heal you right where you're at. You don't need to move a finger. You don't need to move a leg or a muscle that Jesus comes right to where you're at and he heals you right there if I could just get better I'd go to church you're never gonna get better before you go to church and so you're not going to church you gotta come to church messed up sick gouged, lame, hurting, weak. And Jesus heals you right where you're at. Don't matter what the condition is. It don't matter how bad the marriage is. It doesn't matter how, how bad the finances are. The cars are the kids can be running amok, but Jesus will enter right into that situation and heal your disease. Is there anyone here that believes that we serve a God who can go into any situation, go into any circumstance, and that he can bring healing, wholeness, and wellness and that he can give you your life back. How many people here on a Wednesday night say, I want my life back. If you're standing, look down to your neighbor, say, get up. You notice some people ain't standing, only some people are standing. The devil's pulling your leg. He doesn't want you to get up. You want to get up. You want to pump your fist, but he's like, no. But you got to push through. And you got to get up and give God glory. Give him praise. Give him honor. Give him what he deserves. I got to get up. I can't stay down. I have to get up. I have to keep going. I have to keep fighting. I can't sit here no more. I got to push. I got to break through. I got giants to conquer. I must get up. I got a wife to get back. I must get up. I got children counting on me. I have to get up. you're up and it only took almost 40 minutes it didn't take 38 years praise the Lord let's close let me close let me close in verse number 10 let's read this verse and we'll close it says the Jews therefore said to him who is cured the word cured means he got better as he went along. You may not be perfect where you're at right now, but the Bible says you're cured. That means that he couldn't walk at first, you understand? He couldn't walk so good. His walk was a little rickety, a little rackety. He just got born again. You understand? He's an infant. He can't, can't even walk. can't even learn how to walk. Trying to feel his way. How does this even work? How do these legs work? I used him in 38 years. The Bible says that he was cured. That word means like therapy. That somebody there was assisting him and helping him to get up and walk stronger as he went along. And the Jews were watching him. All the religious leaders. And they said this. It's the Sabbath. It's the day of rest. And it's not lawful for you to carry your mat. If we were to translate that Greek language into English, they were saying this to him. Get back on your mat. 
it's not lawful for you to walk. It's not lawful for you to be whole. Get back on the mat. And that's what the devil's telling you. Give up. Take your position. Get back to your porch. Go back to the hood. Go back to the streets. Go back to your messed up life. Get back on your mat. What are you doing? You're breaking the law. And you tell the devil, it's not the first time I broke the law. I'll break your law. He breaks the law. Play something beautiful. Let's hear. Oh, he's good, huh? We're landing the plane right now. They told him to get back, get back in your place. Who do you think you are? Who are you taking holy warriors? Who are you with your wayward outreach t-shirt? Who do you think you are with your new Bible? Who do you get back on your mat? He breaking the law. Listen to this. Let me see that mat. I hope his mat wasn't pink like this. <laughs> and so he's walking around. And they tell him, you're not allowed to carry that. It's the mat that gets him in trouble. He's carrying it when he should be resting. He's carrying it when he should be resting. Because you cannot enter into God's rest as long as you're carrying your mat. You're still tied to your past, your life before Jesus found you is in the mat. And you're still carrying it because maybe just in case this God thing don't work out, I still got still got my mat I still got my oldies I still got my music you still got your little black book still got your speed pipe still got your lighters your bongs that's your mat. And as long as you're carrying the mat, you're never going to truly rest. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And so the biggest decision has now entered into this man's life. The biggest decision, and some of you in this room are facing the biggest decision of your life. He can either do one of two things. He can either get back on his mat and do what they say, or he can let go of the mat. But until you let go, 
there is no rest. And the devil will keep reminding you, get back in your place. And you can't conquer as long as you have a man. Because you still go back to the streets with your man. You're still smoking dope with the homeboys, all the sick people with your mat. You still like to hang out with the sickos, pile up together in the hoop deep. What's up? You got a mat and you're fooling yourself. My goodness, you got to get rid of the mat so that you can rest. Amen. And so all over this room, if you're ready to give it all up, I want you to get out of your seat. Get up. Tell your neighbor, get up. Get out of your seat and run to this altar real fast. Leave your mat in your chair. Leave your mat right there. Don't bring it with you. Someone's about ready to get up in this place. Somebody shout, get up. Shout it again, get up. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to give it up? I think you are. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He come to set you free. He come to your poolside to pull you out of, all, out of your disease out of your infirmity, out of your loss, out of your depression, the anxiety, the fear. Jesus has come to pull you out of that place. And when you leave here tonight, the Bible says that you are cured, you're saved. You are born again. But you have to learn how to walk still. And so we have classes. We have holy warriors starting over again. And it's going to help you learn how to walk. How to walk strong. And not give up. We got so many things here at the church to help you, to support you. Jobs are available. Resources are available. We almost take excuses out of the way. There's literally no excuse recovery, men's home, women's home, women and children's homes. It's like a one-stop shop. God has given us great provision and resources so that we are without excuse. I love that. Amen. Let's lift our hands. This evening, you came up here. Lift both hands. So I know you dropped that mat. Drop it all. When you lift your hands, I want you to just do that as a, as a symbol that you're dropping everything. I'm just letting go. I'm letting go. Say that with me. I am letting go of my past, of my failures, of my sickness, of my sin of my lust, of my anger, of my unforgiveness, of my jealousy. I am letting it go and I am getting up right now in the presence of Almighty God. I am getting up and I receive the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. I receive forgiveness and salvation for my soul. I thank you, Jesus. 
and I receive the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit come fall upon me rest upon me remain upon me here he comes lift your hands receive the Holy Spirit lift your hands receive the Holy Spirit lift your hands he's got it right there that gentleman right here receive the Holy Spirit there you go touch him yep receive she's got it too receive the Holy Spirit receive say I receive the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit come when you say come he's gonna come right there Holy Spirit come there he is go ahead touch him touch their head Walter workers touch him Holy Spirit come you can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit come teach me He's your teacher. Holy Spirit, teach me. We thank you, Lord. We glorify you. We give you honor. We give you praise. No more going back. No more staying down. We're getting up. We're going to fulfill your call. We're not going back to the porch. We're not going to go back to where we were. We're not going to go back to our old lifestyle. We're going to follow you, God, for the rest of our days. If you agree with that prayer, I want you just to give God a big shout of praise in this house tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We love you guys. Friday, help me out. Relationship seminar, Friday night, seven o'clock. Pastor Marco is gonna be answering questions at the relationship seminar. Years and years of wisdom, Pastor Gabe, a panel. You can come ask all questions and get all their secrets. They'll be here Friday. We love you guys, God bless you. Have an amazing week.